Hi there, welcome to this Kaplan Masterclass on Business Valuations. My name's Andrew Mower, and I'm a tutor at Kaplan Financial. Now, the aim of the session today is that we're going to look at four main business valuation methods. The first of which are these asset-based valuations. We're then going to move on to dividend-based valuations, looking at the dividend valuation model. We're then going to move on to PE ratios, and then we're going to uh, finish off with our discounted cash flows. Now, with each of these methods, I just want to give you a really nice, simple overview of each method. So for each one, we'll think about how you calculate the valuation using the method and also then look at some advantages and disadvantages of each method, uh, which seem to be really popular in exams at the moment. So let's start with these asset based valuations. Then, um, So as you can see, the value of a company, if we're just valuing it based on its assets, is just its assets less its liabilities. So really nice, straightforward way to value a company. You just take their assets, deduct the liabilities, and that effectively gives you the value of the company's equity. Now, when we're doing this, there are a few options as to what we can use for our assets. We could use um, our book values from the statement of financial position. So just looking at what they are on the financial statements. We could use this thing, the net realizable value. So that's if the company were to sell off all their assets, how much would they get for them? Now, that tends to be the absolute lowest that that company would want to sell their business for. It's pretty much, if we put it all on eBay, how much would we get? And so that's probably the lowest they'd want to go in any negotiations. Alternatively, a company could use their replacement cost, which is where we look to instead uh, think how much would it cost to build this business up from scratch? So if we were to start it completely again, um, everything brand new, so new property, new assets, everything, how much would it cost? And we often assume that's the most that a buyer would want to pay because otherwise, yeah, why would they bother buying a, a company for less if they could get it brand new um, and using that replacement cost? So there are a few alternatives. And again, you just be led by the question as to which of these um, would, would work. Um, but yeah, a really nice, as I say, straightforward way to value a company. Now, the great thing about this is it's so uh, quick and easy to do. Um, readily available information. If you've got a company's statement of financial position, you can work out the value of that business based on their assets. It's nice and easy. Uh, and as I mentioned, we can use it to set a minimum price in negotiations often for the, uh, for the, the seller, which is great. It also works for loss-making companies. Um, so if companies are making a loss or they're looking to potentially go into liquidation soon, um, yeah, then this is a, is a method that, that works quite nicely. It's also quite good if you're a particularly asset heavy business. So if you're a property investor, for example, then this would give you a good indication as to the value of your business as well. Now, there are several major disadvantages, though, of using this technique. The first one is the fact that the information may be outdated, uh, depending on how they uh, value their things on, on the statement of financial position, if they held them at, at uh, cost less accumulated depreciation. These figures may be really, really out of date. Um, so that may not give you a, a relevant figure when you're valuing a business. It also ignores intangibles. So it's not going to include things like uh, the company's uh, skill sets and their brands and reviews and their customer base and the data that they've acquired over the years. So all these things that haven't been capitalized, haven't been included in their statement of financial position, wouldn't be included. Um, and so that's a big weakness. The other thing is, it's not looking at their growth potential. We're not looking at what's going to happen in the future. We're valuing a business based on their current assets. And people don't invest in companies because of their assets. Um, if you think about service industries, if you think you, know, you, you may be a, a world-renowned uh, chef or a world-renowned personal trainer, you know, your reputation, all the celebrities might want to eat at your restaurant or use you to, um, for their personal training sessions. But that's just getting ignored. Um, and we're just looking at what assets they've got. So it's, it's, it's a really, it's a really uh, sort of tricky one. And we don't look at what potential they've got going forwards um, and, and what they could earn. So it's just looking at their assets. So it's a nice starting point. It's really quick, really easy to do. But overall, yeah, it's not going to give you the most accurate valuation of a business. Our second method I want to consider is this idea of the dividend valuation model. Now, this one uses a company's dividends to predict what the business is worth. Um, so have a little think about what the company's um, going to be worth here. There is a formula. Um, so the value of the company, uh, you take the dividend and you times it by one plus their growth rate. And then you divide that by the cost of equity minus growth. Um, and that will give you the value of a company. 
Now, if you use the total dividend of the business, so you know the, the, the overall figure of dividends for the year, um, so potentially millions of pounds or dollars, um, that will give you the value of the whole company when you use this formula. If you just use one dividend, so dividend per share effectively, that will give you the value of one share. So this formula, you can use it either way, just in case you see it um, done in a slightly different way. If you use total dividends, that will give you the value of the whole company. If you use one dividend, that will just give you the value of one share. You've then got your dividend growth percentage, um, which is G. Um, so that will go in there. That is an estimate of uh, how much we expect our dividends to grow by each year. Uh, and then KE is the company's cost of equity. Um, now, this DVM is assuming that the value of a company is worth all the dividends it will ever pay out into the future. So this formula is actually this growing perpetuity formula. We're assuming if this company pays dividends in perpetuity, so forever and ever, growing at this constant rate G, if we took the present value of all those dividends it will ever pay, that's how much it's worth right now. Um, so that's what this, this formula is looking at. That's the theory behind it. Um, so it's, it is, we're looking at potential um, future growth and we're looking at the dividend policy. Um, so it is quite a nice way of doing it. And again, it's not too tricky to, um, to find out. We'll think about some advantages and disadvantages. So it does include growth um, and it does also link to shareholder wealth now because we're thinking about those dividends. We're thinking about how much we're expecting to earn as investors, which is, which is good. Um, and it, you can use it to uh, value minority holdings. So if you're only buying a few shares, it's quite a nice method um, to, to use because if you're only buying a few shares, you're not going to affect the company's dividend policy. Um, so using their, their, their forecast dividends is absolutely fine. Big, big weaknesses, though. First of all, it assumes constant growth of dividends. So that G figure, we're assuming, stays the same forever. So if we say growth is 5%, we're assuming, uh, what we're saying is that these dividends are going to grow at 5% forever and ever into the future, which isn't going to happen. Yeah, there'll be years where they may not even pay a dividend. There'll be years the dividend might go down. Um, so having that constant growth is, is really um, a massive assumption. It also relies on this cost of equity figure in the formula, KE. Um, and as you may know from, um, from other studies, that's not necessarily the easiest uh, figure to find. And also we're assuming that that's constant forever. Um, and all it takes is a, a change in the company's gearing levels or the change in their risk. Uh, and that cost of equity figure would change. Um, so again, assuming that that's constant forever is, is not necessarily going to be valid. And also not all companies pay dividends. You know, some companies, especially newer companies, uh, like to reinvest that money in the business rather than paying out dividends. So then you can't use this. It's not going to work. Um, or loss-making companies aren't going to be paying dividends. It's, well, it's unlikely they will. So again, this, um, this, this method wouldn't work in those situations. Um, but again, it's, it, it's a start. We're building in a bit of growth now and uh, a little bit of the, the future potential, which is, which is better than the asset one we looked at earlier. The third method is this idea of using a P-E ratio, which is the price earnings ratio. So to value your company, uh, you need to take a suitable P-E ratio and times it by your earnings. Now, when I say a suitable P-E ratio, what you're often going to have to do here is borrow a P-E ratio from a similar company. Now, it might be that there's um, a company that's in the same industry uh, as you, which you could use, or there might be industry average figures for P-E ratios that you could use. And the idea is that the P-E ratio is um, the value of a company divided by its earnings. There are a couple of ways of doing it, as you can just see on that, on that second line there. Um, so, for example, if a company's P-E ratio is 12, what that's saying is this company is worth 12 times more than its annual earnings. Or you can do it on a single share basis as well. You could say that this company's share is worth 12 times more than its earnings per share. So again, you can do it on a big scale or, or a little scale, it doesn't matter. So the, the concept is we want to value a company. Um, so it's likely to be unlisted. If it's a listed company, it's, it, we'd know its value already probably. Um, so if it's an unlisted company, we want to know how much is this company worth? What we'll do is we'll find a similar listed company um, who have a PE ratio. We can go and look at their share price and, and their earnings um, and we can work it out and we can say, right, their P ratio is 12. So this company that's similar to us is worth 12 times more than their annual earnings. We therefore can say that we are going to be worth 12 times more than our annual earnings. So we're going to say if they're worth 12 times more than their annual earnings, so are we. Um, we can just apply it to our own earnings. Um, so that's what we're doing. 
you're just taking a suitable PE ratio, which is borrowed from someone else and timing it by our earnings figure to give you a value of the company. We're borrowing someone else's and assuming that that multiple applies to us as well. Now, when we're doing earnings, um, as you can see at the bottom, that's profit after tax, uh, less any preference dividends. So if there are any preference dividends in there, you would need to take those off. Um, so they're earnings. And when we're doing that, we want to make sure that those earnings are what we call sustainable earnings. So we need to make sure that they're um, going to continue into the future. Um, so they're not, we're not including any sort of one-off items. So if this year, for example, they um, sold a load of land, um, so they, they sold loads of land this year, that's probably not going to happen again in the future. Um, so when you're doing this, we just need to make sure that these are um, sustainable earnings. Um, is what we expect to happen um, going forwards. Um, so take out any one-off items um, and that'd be great. So the good things about this, um, it, they are based on similar listed companies. Um, so hopefully it will give us a, a good idea as to what our business is, is worth. Um, includes the impact of their brand and reputation because we're looking at earnings, um, which is good. And it is widely used. I know a lot of people who, who work in, um, in companies who need to value other businesses. And this is a method that they use a lot. It's Again, it's, it's really quick. It gives you a rough indication as to the value of the business, which is nice. This idea of um, borrowing someone's PE ratio there as a disadvantage is, yeah, it, it, it's unlikely to give us you know, an accurate figure, isn't it? You're just borrowing a similar company. They, they'll do things slightly different. They'll have a different attitude to risk. They'll have different levels of gearing. They'll have all sorts of different things going on there. So borrowing a PE ratio is, is potentially a, um, yeah, a, a, a major disadvantage. So that word proxy um, is just that idea of you're just borrowing someone else's. Um, so when, when we talk about a proxy, um, it just means that you've you've borrowed it from somewhere else. Now you are using historic earnings, so we're using last year's earnings. Um, so going forwards, it may not be. Um, again, that may not be the case. So we're not including any future earnings. We're just looking at what we've what we've achieved this year. And and this idea of an adjustment for non marketability, as I mentioned, we're going to be valuing a company that's not listed. Um, so its shares are going to be much harder to sell compared to a listed company. So when we're borrowing this P ratio, we'll be borrowing it from a listed company. Um, we then have to take off a little bit, just deduct a bit, just to reflect the fact that, right, our company isn't as attractive as this other one because our, our shares are harder to sell. We're also less regulated. Um, so yeah, less, um, less information available about us and so on. So what we tend to say is that there's usually um, around about a 25% um, deduction um, to reflect the non-marketability of our company shares. Um, now that's fairly arbitrary; it's, it's fairly random. But yeah, if this comes up in the exam, you, you're just looking to to show the markers. Right, I acknowledge the fact we've borrowed someone else's PE ratio. That's for a listed company. We're not listed, so I just need to take a little bit off just to just to make it a bit of a fairer comparison. So 25%, as I say, is is pretty much the going rate for for a deduction for non-marketability. Again, it is fairly arbitrary, but it just shows that you know what you're doing. The final one is the discounted cash flow technique. And, and all this is really is, is just a, a big old MPV. Um, so the discounted cash flow, the value of a company is the present value of future cash flows. Um, so it's what we expect our cash flows to be in the future, um, discounted back to the present value. Um, now, when you do this, what you tend to do is you'll have, you'll set up a, a column, like um, you'll set up a, a table almost like this. So you have your T1, uh, T2, uh, your T3, um, T4, et cetera. Um, so you'll set up an MPV um, like you usually would. Um, we don't often have a T0 column when we're doing these. That usually starts, we're usually looking at the cash flows in the future. So we'll start from T1, T2, T3, T4, uh, and so on. Now, what sometimes happens is that you end up with this final year perpetuity. So what they, what they often say is uh, that in the final year, we'll have some sort of year five to infinity type thing. Um, so they often call that the planning horizon for the first few years. They're the years that we know in detail what we expect to happen. So you'll have your sales, your costs, um, your capital allowances, your, your tax, all those sorts of bits, just like a normal MPV. And for those four years, you might have fairly detailed forecasts as to what your figures will be. Once you get to maybe year five, or again, depends on the question and, and the business, but once you get to year five, we sort of go, well, we're not too sure about the the figures from here on because it's quite hard to forecast that far in advance so we'll just assume that they carry on at the same level into the future 
Um, so we'll just assume that they carry on like that forever. Um, so that's the idea of a perpetuity. So in that final year, we've got what we call a delayed perpetuity, and they might even include a little bit of growth. Um, so within this, um, there's this final year perpetuity factor. So rather than using a discount factor in that final year, what you do is you can do one over the rate minus growth. So that's the R minus G. And then you times it by the discount factor uh, for the year before the perpetuity is starting. So in that little example I just did up there, um, the perpetuity starting in year five. So what you do is you times it by the discount factor for year four. So that's that idea of a delayed perpetuity. You always times by the discount factor for the year before. Um, so if there is some sort of growth, if it says it's growing at 1%, you do one over um, the rate, which will be your, your cost of capital, um, take off your growth, uh, and then times it by the discount factor for the year before. That's that, that final year perpetuity factor. Um, now, in some qualifications, they split your uh, the way you can do this into a couple of, couple of things. You've got your free cash flows, your FCFs, um, which are the ones that are before interest, but post-tax. Um, if you are given those and need to use those, you use the WAC as your discount rate. And then at the end, you need to take off the market value of debt to give the value of equity for the business, which is what we're after. Um, and if you've got FCFEs, which are free cash flows to equity, now they're the after tax and after interest um, cash flows. So the FCFEs, um, you've, you've already taken off your interest and your tax on these. You can just discount those using the cost of equity. Uh, and that will give you straight to uh, the, the value of, uh, of equity of the business. So free cash flows to equity, you discount using the cost of equity, and that gives you the value of equity. So it's sort of equity, 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 uh, which makes it a little bit easier to remember. Um, now, in some qualifications, they don't distinguish between those, and you, you don't need to worry too much about that. But um, just thought I'd, I'd flag that in case, um, in case that is useful. So in terms of how you structure it, you need to do yeah, a big old MPV from year one onwards, looking at sales costs, et cetera. Um, and then you just discount it all using the, the suitable discount rate that we've just talked about there. In terms of the um, advantages, really detailed. It's, it's the best method we look at um, in terms of the accuracy and, and everything that's going on, because you're looking at each year's cash flow separately, which is incredibly detailed. When you compare that to something like the PE ratio, where you've taken one year's profits and times it by a number, yeah, this is far, far better, isn't it? Includes forecasted growth, so you're anticipating what's going to happen over the next few years, which is which is also good. And also the fact it uses cash flows, we much prefer because they're more factual. You can spend cash. Profits are theoretical. You can manipulate profits by changing a few things, uh, whereas these cash flows are much, uh, much more factual, so we prefer those. In terms of disadvantages, we are relying on these forecasts. Um, again, really hard to know. Um, what's going to happen that far in advance, especially with that perpetuity, if there is one in that final year. Um, yeah, we don't know that it's going to carry on going at that rate. So we just have to, um, we have to take a little bit of a guess. They are quite complex. They're quite time consuming. Um, and so, yeah, they, they're quite, again, by, due to the fact they are so detailed and thorough, um, they do take a little bit of time to get there. Also, they're really reliant on that cost of capital. So if you use a cost of capital or, or cost of equity, depending on the question of say 10%, if you then did that again, using the rate of 12%, the value of that business is going to be far lower. Um, so it's really dependent on that. And again, there are so many assumptions, guesses, um, and, and things that go into that when you calculate it, um, that just a, just a small change would really affect the value of the business. So again, very um, sensitive to changes in some of these assumptions when you're doing these, these methods. Um, but again, it is by far the best method that we, that we consider uh, the most detailed, the most thorough. Okay, so they're the four methods. Um, just as a quick overview, thinking about the pros and cons of each, um, you will have loads of examples that you can practice and yeah, really good to, to get some numbers in there. Um, but hopefully that gives you a nice oversight of the key methods and the advantages and disadvantages of each, um, which seem to be very popular um, in, in various exams at the moment, asking you to, um, to evaluate these methods. Um, so I hope you found that useful um, and good luck with your studies.